This video is brought to you by Devout Decals, makers of reusable Catholic art for your home altar, your bedroom, and your home classroom. I wanted to do something a little different this Sunday. A couple of years ago, I presented the writings of a forgotten Dominican, Father Vincent McNabb. He's not forgotten if you're a reader of Catholic social teaching or are familiar with the Chesterton types and Belloc like I am, as he was a friend of both G.K. Chesterton and Hilaire Belloc. Father McNabb was a Dominican priest who was an advocate of getting back to the land, leaving modernity behind in the fetid cities. When, And when I last presented him, in the response was, well, that sounds nice, but it isn't practical. Two years later, I kind of wonder if people will still feel the same way, given everything that has happened since. Here the priest talks about the simplicity of the gospel, one applied to how we should be living, not just in terms of morality, but in terms of the material as well, our material situation and environment. And he does ask and answer the question of why our Lord was not born into a simple farming family, but was instead born into a family that would live itself in the cities. So I hope you find this a good thing to think about on this Sunday. God bless. The Call of Nazareth. Some Thoughts on the Age-Old Exodus from the City to the Land by Father Vincent McNabb. It is the best part of twenty years since the matter of this letter was first broached between us. Student and teacher were so akin in aim and ways of thinking that at the end of our thought-gathering, neither of us could measure in the yield of thought what was his share. Early in our thinking, and Jesus, the Messiah of our elder brothers, was always the beginning and goal of our thought. We realized that the great elder brother movements of Reformation and Redemption were movements out of complex, organized city life to the simple life with God on the land, or even in the desert. Gradually, the dogged spade work of the archaeologist had proved to us that when Abraham left Haran for the desert, it was not Chaldean slum dwellers alone who formed his train. There was also something we can venture to call an intelligentsia, of whom Abraham was leader, and their going out from a decadent pre-Christian and pre-elder brother society to the primaries of human life and liberty. In our discussions on this earliest record of a group exodus, we often asked ourselves the unanswered question whether it was not to this intelligentsia-led exodus that the earliest record should be assigned of an explicit and formulated credo and an intelligent creator. We could not see in the matchless hexameron of the first two chapters of Genesis the product of unlettered nomads, but we were agreed that the religious atmosphere around Ter and his son Abraham at Ur and Haran was such that the bugle music of this first quicumque volt would be fit war song for an intelligentsia shaking the town dust of pre-elder brother society from its feet. To us in our desperate venture of thinking, there seemed a dramatic inevitability in this exodus from Chaldea being followed after some centuries by the exodus from Egypt. It was like the phenomenon of second conversion, which makes the soul's return to God authentic and final. Again, the two goings out from Chaldea and Egypt were alike not merely in substance, but in those lesser modes that seemed to betoken a law fulfilled. As the Chaldean exodus was led by an alarmed intelligentsia, as it seemed to us, so too the simple brick factory hands of Egypt were guided out into the desert with God by Moses, skilled in the learning of the Egyptians. We could not refrain from seeing Moses surrounded by a group of intelligences who have given us a social code which the Greece of Solon, Lycurgius, Plato, and Aristotle failed to revival. Again, it seemed to us that if our elder brother's reaction against the sort of neo-pre-elder brother society of Chaldea gave us the hexameron, the reaction against them of Egypt gave us the Decalogue. In each case, reformation and inspiration came when the God-appointed leaders shepherded their people out of a decadent city organization back to the land. You will remember how it weighed upon our minds that the precedent of Abraham and Moses seemed to be set aside by Jesus Christ. Search as we would, we could not find a trace of his having left an Ur or a Memphis for the desert. Our inner conviction that all true reformation must be a return to things primary of landwork and handwork almost began to wither, if not die, when Deo Gratias, a text of St. Matthew, restored our conviction from its recovery. Out of Egypt have I called my son. Arise, take the child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel. See Matthew chapter 2, verses 15 to 20. 
The day we found the meaning of these prophetic and inspired words, we almost shouted for joy, as if a doom of doubt had been lifted from our shoulders. We almost chanted aloud a further praise of the tax collector Matthew. And coming, he dwelt in a hamlet called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was said by the prophet, that he shall be called a Nazarene. It was with joy on joy that, with still further study and prayer, we still further realized how punctiliously and completely this son of Abraham had followed the lead of his earthly sire by turning from the complexities and complex complication of city life to the simplicity primaries of a life with God and with the earth as God had made it. Some lesser riddles of the adventure of redemption, though still left unsolved, were so much a part of what had been solved as no longer to seem incapable of solution. Thus we had asked ourselves, if land work is of such necessity, indeed of primary necessity for redeeming the world, why did not the Redeemer choose all or some of the primary apostles from workers on the land? The question thus broached had not long to wait for an answer. It was as if under weight of this difficulty we found the solution. He who brought in the supernatural order did not rest it on the wreckage of the natural order. Indeed, he himself said, as if beforehand with an answer to our doubt, No man putting his hand on the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. See Luke chapter 9 verse 62. The word made flesh was not minded to disturb the divine order which made land work the primary duty and need of beings, demanding the daily bread to keep them in being. It was only from work of secondary needs such as fishing, or of still less needs such as tax collecting, that Jesus chose his disciples. Land work was an institution so indispensable and divine, that from it he took no workers, but only the wisdom of parables. You will remember the day when another of our lesser questions was answered to our joy. We were lopping the branches of a felled birch to provide fuel for the bread oven. For the hundredth time we had asked ourselves, why did not the Son of God choose to be born on a farm? Perhaps our previous talk of Russia's naive efforts after the cooperative state gave us the clue. At last one of us said gravely, but the incarnate word, as he could not disturb the land unit, so he could not be born in the land unit. To the inevitable question, why? came the inevitable and satisfactory answer, because the divinely instituted land unit is the normal family, and the word made flesh could not be one of several children. At once we saw that, as the only child of the heavenly father must be the only child of an earthly mother, he could be born nowhere save in a home whose craft did not demand the normal family of several children. All this was gradually opening our eyes to the full meaning of the title officially given to the Redeemer of the world in the hour of the world's redemption. Forever the Son of God and of Mary, this Redeemer of the world, will be Jesus of Nazareth. Indeed, Jesus the Nazarene, as one says, Donald the Crofter. I used to envy those who made three years of Bible study in the university that is the Holy Land. How often have I made you bring back memories of the hamlets and byways hallowed by the feet of Jesus? But though the very stones of Nazareth were known to you, it was only after years of speech and thought in common that you, old pupil, and I, your teacher, saw what Nazareth was and meant and what was meant by the title, Jesus and Nazarene. For us both, Nazareth was always a highland hamlet, whose every stone was hallowed by thirty years of God's redemptive love. Gradually our eyes began to see this highland hamlet in one of the necessities, as one of those conditional necessities, to use the phrase of the dumb ox of Aquinas, of the enterprise of redemption. For Nazareth was the unit of human society. It was a family of families gathered together in aid and defense of community, with its, within its circuit dwelt the little self-sufficient group of land workers and hand workers. The primary craft of land work and the secondary yet necessary crafts of hand work were there working together in the primary cooperative group. All the sanctities and social necessities of property, purity, and authority were there in their natural soil and setting. If then the Son of God made Nazareth his earthly home and took it as his earthly title, it was because he, the Redeemer in the beginning, who came to make all things new, realized that a Nazareth alone could be the beginning of redemption. For this reason you, my beloved pupil, and I, your unworthy teacher, have come to feel Nazareth calling us, indeed crying out with a loud cavalry shout to us. The theme of that unceasing Nazareth cry is, Come back, not to Ur or Memphis or Jerusalem, but to Nazareth, lest you prepare another Golgotha. So shrill and unceasing is this call of the Nazarene, that in spite of ourselves, it is dulling our ears to all other cries of efficiency, prudence, experience, progress, statesmanship, and if they were but the cracking or rumbling of world tottering to ruin. Much as our will shirks this challenge of the truth, we yet see that, of a truth, only Jesus of Nazareth is a savior and hope of the world. 
Much as our feet falter on the threshold of the way we know the Nazareth alone, where alone Jesus had a home, is a divine pattern to souls who covet to do the Redeemer's work in the Redeemer's way, amidst a strayed lost people who do not yet know that their sorest need is repentance and redemption. There were the words of Father Vincent McNabb. If you're wanting to go deeper into the things he's written, I recommend a book of his called Nazareth or Social Chaos, which is a good primer on his thoughts on what was called the Catholic Land Movement. There are a lot of people talking now and having interest in homesteading and things. You can find various channels on YouTube that teach people these sort of basic skills. And he was convinced that that would be sort of the key to our material happiness, or at least material satisfaction, would be to get back to a more simple means of living. I know, it seems weird to hear that these days, but many people are looking into it now. So again, the book... Go take a look at his uh, writings, and if you want help finding any, just email me. I can lead you in the right direction. Anyway, thanks for listening, and please pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.